What do you do when the laws of the land violate your religious convictions? Now, here in America, there's not very many times when that comes to pass, but that could change. Melanie and I knew someone personally in Missouri that when uh, they first started issuing same-sex marriage licenses in Missouri that she didn't do it on the grounds that it violated her religious beliefs. Others struggle in doctor's offices and pharmacies when asked to prescribe or sell the morning-after pill. And in fact, now there's a new pill that can be taken long after the morning-after that does the same thing that is kind of currently working through the legal system. We've already seen what happens to florists and bakeries that refuse service to people who choose a different lifestyle than the Bible deems acceptable. Why is it okay to refuse service to someone who wants a Confederate flag on their cake, but absolutely dare not refuse service to a same-sex couple, even though both violate you know, the conscience of the person making the cake. Why is one okay and not the other? This morning, I'd like to look at someone in the Bible who found himself in this very situation. So turn with me, if you will, to Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. Now, Daniel, at this point in his life, is an older man. He has gone through... um, This would be the third king that he has served under while in captivity. And I would like to read verses 1 through 14, and it says this. Darius, King Darius that is, thought it would be a good idea to choose 120 governors who would rule his kingdom. He chose three men as supervisors over those governors. And Daniel was one of those supervisors. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I think it's a piece of communion bread. The supervisors were to ensure that the governors did not try to cheat the king. Daniel showed that he could do the work better than the other supervisors and governors. So the king planned to put Daniel in charge of the entire kingdom. <clears throat> because of this, the other supervisors and governors tried to find reasons to accuse Daniel about his work in the government. But they could not find anything wrong with him or any reason to accuse him because he was trustworthy and not lazy or dishonest. Finally, these men said, we will never find any reason to accuse Daniel unless it is about the law of his God. So the supervisors and governors went as a group to the king and said, King Darius, live forever. The supervisors, assistant governors, governors, the people who advise you, and the captains of the soldiers have all agreed that you should make a new law for everyone to obey. For the next 30 days, no one should pray to any god or human except to you, O king. Anyone who doesn't obey will be thrown into the lion's den. Now, O king, make the law and sign your name to it so that it cannot be changed. Then it will be the law of the Medes and the Persians and cannot be canceled. So King Darius signed the law. Even though Daniel knew that the new law had been written, he went to pray in an upstairs room in his house which he had windows that opened toward Jerusalem. Three times each day, Daniel would kneel down to pray and thank God, just as he had always done. Then those men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and talked to him about the law that he had made. They said, didn't you sign a law? That says, no one may pray to any god or human except you, O king. Doesn't it say that anyone 
who disobeys during the next 30 days will be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, yes, that is the law, and the law of the Medes and the Persians cannot be canceled. Then they said to the king, Daniel, one of the captives from Judah is not paying attention to you, O king, or to the law that you signed. Daniel still prays to his God three times a day. The king became very upset when he heard this. He wanted to save Daniel, and he worked hard until sunset, trying to think of a way to save him. <clears throat> you know, I've often thought that King Darius should have wondered about um, them wanting everybody to worship him, but only for 30 days. <clears throat> he, but apparently he didn't think much about it. <clears throat> But what we see is we see Daniel's character. And so Daniel, by this time, is an older man. <clears throat> um, he has lived through the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. He's lived through the reign of Belteshazzar. And now <clears throat> an entirely different nation has taken over. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> and so the Medo-Persian Empire has actually taken over um, and are now in control, and Babylon has fallen. And Daniel has successfully made the transition from the one government to the other government. And Darius was very, very fond of Daniel. But once a law was put into effect, with the Medes and the Persians, that law could not be canceled. Not even the king himself could rescind that command or that law once it was put into place. There are three things that I think that we can see in regard to Daniel's character that I'd like to look at this morning. And the first is this, that Daniel was a man of integrity. Daniel was a man of integrity. In Daniel 6, 4, and 5, it says this, at this, the administrators and satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs. But they were unable to do so. <clears throat> they could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt or negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. Can you imagine if we had men like this in Washington, D.C. today? Men who were so squeaky clean that the only possible, you know, thing that they could find that where they would be willing to violate what, you know, the rules were is if it first and foremost, violated his rules from God. Wow. I imagine America would look like a very different place today if we had men like this who are in Washington. Daniel did the right thing, <clears throat> even when nobody was looking. He did the right thing even when nobody was looking. How do you suppose that these jealous governors were able to put this plan together? Because Daniel was in the habit of every day, three times a day, opening his windows, and they saw him kneeling and praying. They were familiar with, with what Daniel's habits were. And so it was very easy for them to come up with something in order to try and entrap Daniel. Daniel did the right thing, even when no one was looking. You know, and that kind of reminds me of the story of Daniel when he first came into Babylon as a young man. And <clears throat> um, Nebuchadnezzar was training him for service. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would have all been considered very, very fortunate because most slaves didn't get an opportunity to serve the king. Well, at least not in his palace. 
And it would have been easy for Daniel to say, you know what, these fine foods, these foods that I'm not supposed to eat as a Jew, I should probably just put my head down and not make waves. But he didn't. He did what he knew was right, even though it might have been in his best interest not to. Because Daniel was a man of integrity. And he did the right thing even when no one was looking. And even Daniel's enemies knew that Daniel's God came first. Wouldn't that be amazing if that's what people said about us? That no matter what the circumstance is, whether it's our job, whether it's our family, whether it is our interactions in our community, that everybody would know that in our life, God comes first. That's the way it was with Daniel. I mean, you look at what they actually had to say about them. They said, there's no way we're going to find anything on Daniel unless it has to do with his worship of God. Daniel's worship of God, they understood implicitly that it was more important even than his service to the king. He was a man of integrity. Secondly, <clears throat> Daniel was a man of conviction. He was a man of conviction. Daniel 6 verses 10 and 11 says this. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and he prayed giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and they found Daniel praying and asking God for help. You know, I find it interesting that Daniel didn't try to hide his faith. He didn't go the, the day after the edict was passed, the law was passed, and then go close his windows before he got down on his knees to pray. He continued to do what he had always done. He didn't change a single thing. There's probably a lesson in there for us as well. He didn't try to hide his faith. You know, how many young people going to school have said their prayer over their lunch as they dropped their napkin and bent down to pick it up? Because they didn't want people to know that they were praying. I mean, at least they were praying, but... They didn't want people to know that they were praying. Daniel didn't do that. He did what he knew was right, no matter what the circumstances were. He was a man of conviction. He didn't try to hide his faith. And Daniel refused to obey men over God. Daniel could have said to himself, you know, it's only 30 days. We'll just play it on the, on the down low for the next 30 days, and then, then we'll just go back to normal. But if Daniel had done that, what kind of message would he have sent to all of the governors and everybody else and to King Darius? That God only matters most of the time? Or that there are times when um, serving God, as I've always done, doesn't really matter? See, Daniel was unwilling to do those things because he was a man of conviction. And I believe God's calling us to be men and women of conviction as well. To live our life in such a way, as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, that our light shines so that people are drawn to our Heavenly Father. 
In one of the devotions, um, I believe it's the first night, um, I believe it was Ben Crawford that shared that the human eye is capable of picking out, I think he said a tiny flame at up to like seven and a half miles away. It was like something incredible because our eyes are designed to focus in on light. And the thing that he said, um, and I'm assuming he knew what he was talking about, is that if a person is in complete darkness long enough, they will literally go blind. Because the mind or the, uh, our body and our eyes have been created in such a way as to try and capture light. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do men light a candle and then put a basket over the top of it. But they put it on a lampstand so that it gives light to all who are in the house. Therefore, let your light shine in such a way that men may see your good works and glorify your heavenly Father. That's what Daniel was doing. He was living his life in such a way that he was a living, breathing testimony of what God called people to be. And then finally, we see that Daniel was able to make a difference. He was able to make a difference. In Daniel 6, 25 through 28, it says, Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language throughout the land, May you prosper greatly. Issue a decree in every part of my kingdom. People must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed his dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. <clears throat> because Daniel stood up for what was right, he was able to make a difference. Darius sent out a decree to his entire nation that they should worship the God of Daniel. What if Daniel had been eaten by the lions? Well, Daniel still would have done what was right. We look at these passages. We look at Daniel in the lion's den, and we look at <clears throat> David and Goliath, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, and we see how God delivered those people. But you know, there are other times when there wasn't a ram in the thicket. You know what I'm talking about. Abraham goes to, I to sacrifice his son Isaac and he lays him up on top of the altar and he gets ready to offer the sacrifice and God stays Abraham's hand and says, stop, don't do that. I've got a ram here for you in the thicket <clears throat> to sacrifice instead of Isaac. Well, <clears throat> sometimes there is no ram in the thicket. Peter, oral tradition tells us, was crucified upside down for his faith. Tradition tells us that Paul was beheaded for his faith. Were they any less special than Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Were they less special than David or Daniel? No. You see, the call is to be obedient no matter what. 
sometimes it'll end well. And sometimes it may not. But you see, Jesus will never ask you to do anything that he was unwilling to do himself. That's why Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River. Because he expects us to be baptized. Did Jesus have any sins that needed to be forgiven? No. In fact, when Jesus came to John the Baptist, uh, John said, you know, uh, you should be baptizing me. But do you remember what Jesus said? He didn't say, let's do this to forgive my sins. He said, but let's do this to fulfill all righteousness. You see, Jesus did it because he knew that one day he would ask us to be baptized. And he'll never ask us to do something that he himself was unwilling to do. Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you must be willing to take up your cross and follow me. You must be willing, if necessary, to suffer and die for me. But Jesus did that too. He died a horrible death on the cross of Calvary for me and for you. You see, Jesus isn't asking you to do something that he won't do himself. He's not pushing you from behind, but he's leading from the front. In this case, we have a great outcome, don't we? But even if we didn't, God would still expect us to be faithful. Look at the impact Daniel had as a result of his life. Imagine the amount of influence that he was able to have on Darius, who was king of the Medo-Persian Empire, because he was faithful and trustworthy. Daniel made a difference because he stood up for what was right. In the fourth century, there lived a Christian monk named Telemachus. One day he heard the voice of God telling him to go to Rome. He obeyed and he set out on foot. Weeks later, he arrived in the city at the time of a great festival. The monk followed the crowd surging down the streets into the Colosseum. He saw the gladiator stand before the emperor and say, we who are about to die salute you. He then realized these men were going to fight to the death for the entertainment of the crowd. He cried out, in the name of Christ, stop. As the games began, he pushed his way through the crowd, climbed over the wall and dropped onto the floor of the arena. When the crowd saw this tiny figure rushing toward the gladiators and saying, in the name of Christ, stop, they thought it was part of the show and began laughing. When they realized it wasn't, the laughter turned into anger. As he was pleading with the gladiators to stop, one of them plunged a sword into his body. He fell to the sand. And as he was dying, his last words were, In the name of Christ, stop. The gladiator stood looking at the monk lying there. A hush fell over the Colosseum. Way up in the upper rows, a man stood and made his way to the exit. Others began to follow. In dead silence, everyone left the Colosseum. The year was 391, and that was the last battle to the death between gladiators in the Roman Colosseum because of Telemachus's death. Three days later, the emperor, Honorarius, by decree ended the games. Never again in the great stadium did men kill each other for the entertainment of the crowd. All because one tiny voice, 
that could hardly be heard above the pandemonium. You see, because of Daniel's faith, God was glorified. Your actions may have a huge impact on those around you as well. I have one final illustration. It's entitled, One Person Can Make a Difference. <clears throat> it says this, Jean Thompson stood in front of her fifth grade class on the very first day of school in, in the fall and told, told the children a lie. Like most teachers, she looked at her pupils and said that she loved them all the same, that she would treat them all alike. And that was impossible because there in front of her, slumped in his seat on the third row, was a little boy named Teddy Stoddard. Mrs. Thompson had watched Teddy the year before and noticed he didn't play well with the other children, that his clothes were unkempt and that he constantly needed a bath. And Teddy was unpleasant. It got to the point during the first few months that she actually began to take delight in marking his papers with broad red pen, making bold X's and then marking the biggest of all, the fat F on the top of the paper. Because Teddy was a sullen little boy, no one seemed to enjoy him either. At school, where Mrs. Thompson taught, she was required to view each child's records, and she put Teddy's off until last. When she opened his file, she was in for a surprise. His first grade teacher wrote, Teddy is a bright, inquisitive child with a ready laugh. He does his work neatly and has good manners. He is a joy to be around. His second grade teacher wrote, Teddy is an excellent student, well liked by his classmates, but he is troubled because his mother has a terminal illness and life at home must be a struggle. His third grade teacher wrote, Teddy is withdrawn and doesn't show much interest in school. He doesn't have many friends and sometimes sleeps in class. He is tardy and could become a problem. By now, Mrs. Thompson realized the problem, but Christmas was coming fast. It was all she could do with the school play and all until the day before the holidays began, and she was suddenly forced to focus on Teddy Stoddard. Her children brought her presents, all in beautiful ribbon and bright paper, except for Teddy's, which was clumsily wrapped in the heavy brown paper of a scissored grocery bag. Mrs. Thompson took pains to open it in the middle of her other presents. Some of the children started to laugh when she found a rhinestone bracelet with some of the stones missing and a bottle that was one quarter full of cologne. She stifled the children's laughter when she exclaimed how pretty the bracelet was, putting it on and dabbing some of the perfume behind the other wrist. Teddy Stoddard stayed behind just long enough to say, Mrs. Thompson, Today you smell just like my mom used to. After the children left, she cried for at least an hour. On that very day, she quit teaching, reading, and writing, and speaking. Instead, she began teaching children. Jean Thompson paid particular attention to the one they called Teddy. As she worked with him, his mind seemed to come alive. The more she encouraged him, the faster he responded. On days that there would be an important test, Mrs. Thompson would remember that cologne. By the end of the year, he had become one of the smartest children in class. And well, he had also become the pet of the teacher who had once vowed to love all of her children exactly the same. A year later, <clears throat> She found a note under her door from Teddy telling her that of all of the teachers he'd had in elementary, she was her favorite. Six years went by before she got another note from Teddy. He then wrote that he had finished high school, third in his class, 
and she was still his favorite teacher of all time. Four years after that, she got another letter saying that while things had been tough at times, he'd stayed in school, had stuck with it, and would graduate from college with the highest of honors. He assured Mrs. Thompson that she was still his favorite teacher. Then four more years passed, and yet another letter came. This time he explained that after he got his bachelor's degree, he decided to go a little further. The letter explained that she was still his favorite teacher, but that now his name was a little longer. The letter was assigned Theodore F. Stoddard, M.D. The story doesn't end there. You see, there was yet another letter that spring. Teddy said he had met his, this girl and was going to be married. He explained that his father had died a couple of years ago, and he was wondering, well, if Mrs. Thompson might agree to sit in the pew, usually reserved for the mother of the groom. And guess what? She wore that bracelet, the one with several rhinestones missing. And I'll bet on that special day, Jean Thompson smelled just like, well, just like the way Teddy remembered his mother smelling on their last Christmas together. The moral is this. You can never tell what type of impact you may make on another's life by your actions or lack of action. Consider this fact in your venture through life. God may very well use you to change the world around you or the life of another if you'll only allow yourself to stand strong and let God use you. The theme of camp this year was, Who Am I? And one of the ladies, one of the faculty that spoke at the campfire shared a little bit about her life growing up. She shared that her father was an alcoholic, that he would strike her, and it was worse when he was angry, that he was never satisfied with anything that she ever did. Her mother was a drug addict, but her mother was her world. The one thing that she clung to in the midst of the turmoil and uh, storm of her father, until one day she was at school waiting for her mom to pick her up, and she never came. She was abandoned by her own mother. She went on to relate, you know, her feelings of inadequacy and uh, low self-esteem and low self-worth. But then she talked about how others, Christian people, had made a difference in her life and brought her to the place where she is today. Whether or not the illustration I read is true, I'm not sure. But I do know the story. Molly's story is true. You can make a difference. And you never know what kind of a past people have had to struggle with. You are the hands and feet of Jesus. And you can make a difference.